Hello, everybody. Good evening. I'm sorry it's so cold tonight. No, the microphone is working. It doesn't amplify. They're just recording my voice for the podcast. Um, my name is Tom Hoon. I chair the BFA program in visual and critical studies here at SVA. And we are hosting um, this evening's event. We're very happy to have Greg Horowitz with us this evening to talk about hoarding and adventures in form. Greg is a philosopher. Turns out it's one of the most interesting things in the world to be, especially a philosopher who works in philosophy of art and aesthetic theory. Um, Greg received his bachelor's degree from Sarah Lawrence College, and then he did a master's degree in philosophy at Boston University and a PhD in philosophy at Rutgers. And then he spent a number of years, I think about 17, teaching philosophy at Vanderbilt University down in Nashville. And then the last six years, Greg was the chair of the social sciences and cultural studies department at Pratt, our sister institution over there in Fort Greene. And Greg is probably best known for a book he published a few years ago called Sustaining Loss, Art and Mournful Life. I recommend it to you. Um, he's a recipient of many awards. I'll mention just one. He was a few years ago a, um, a fellow at the American Academy in Berlin for a year. So would you all please join me in welcoming Greg Horowitz. Um, hi, and happy Valentine's Day to you, too. Um, so I, I want to thank Tom and SVA for hosting me tonight. This is going to be the um, first public trying out of the ideas that you're going to hear. Um, there have been many private um, tryings out of them, but that doesn't count for anything. Um, I should also say that um, despite the text on the poster, um, in which I promised to talk about Alghero Boetti, Paul McCarthy, and Agnes Martin. I'm, in fact, only going to talk about Alighiero Boetti tonight. Um, I will, at the point in the paper, which is already long enough, at the point in the paper when I would have talked about Paul McCarthy and Agnes Martin, I'll flag those. And if anybody would like, we can talk about that more in the Q&A. Um, if anybody is disappointed, that I'm not going to talk about Paul McCarthy or Agnes Martin. I'll leave a couple of minutes if anybody wants to leave before I start. OK. Um, Alighiero Boetti, it turns out, is interesting enough. Um, OK, so hoarding or adventures in form. It's a core presupposition of psychoanalytic theory and practice that pathological thoughts and behavior, however unintelligible they may seem at first, are, like normal thoughts and behavior, nothing but efforts to solve the vexing problems of human life. The presupposition is not that normal and pathological are on a continuum with clear cases on the extreme ends and larger or smaller gray area in the middle. The point is much stronger than that. Normal and pathological states, normal and pathological thinking and behavior are functionally identical as attempted solutions to life's problems. The differences between normal psychologies and psychopathologies must therefore lie elsewhere than in a difference between the purposes and intentions they embody. The therapeutic upshot of this presupposition is clear. Psychotherapists form no cognitive or moral judgments about the mentation and behavior of their patients. Or perhaps it would be more accurate to say that such judgments as they will inevitably form, since they are people after all, are irrelevant to the practical therapeutic task at hand, which is to assist their patients in discovering new solutions to their problems that do not require them to suffer needlessly. From the theoretical point of view, however, things are considerably more complicated. The distinction between the normal and the pathological The distinction between the normal and the pathological is ineliminable in all sciences that use the concept of a functionally organized system 
in short, an organ, for explanatory purposes. What makes the liver the liver is not simply that it's a mass of cells in the upper right quadrant of the abdomen. The liver is the mass of cells organized to serve the needs of digestion, detoxification, and so on. It is defined by, organized around its function. And where something is defined by its function, the distinction between its being well-functioning, poorly functioning, and ill-functioning is already at work. In this respect, no theory of human mental life, where the mind is understood as an organ, can do without the distinction between the normal and the pathological. There's a schism in the psychological sciences about how to understand the implication of this point. Some theorists and clinicians argue that pathological behavior and thinking are the mental equivalent of organic illnesses, constitutional defects, as it were, in the mental organ. Others argue that since psychopathologies are, like normal psychologies, efforts to solve the problems of human life, the salient difference is that psychopathological solutions fail to conform to social norms and so produce suffering in their wake. From the first perspective, people suffering from psychopathologies are victims of a defect that destines their natural coping strategies to fail, while from the second perspective, they're victims of social bad luck. Now, while there's truth to be gleaned from both perspectives, in this lecture, I will largely take up the second one to discuss obsessive-compulsive hoarding disorder, usually shortened to OCHD. But as it's not my business to offer either a theory or a therapy for the disorder, I should state my reason for taking this slant right at the outset. To draw a strong constitutional distinction between pathological and normal psychology is to suppose that what the sufferer of psychopathology is doing the aims and intentions of his thinking, feeling, and acting, that this is different in kind from what the normal person is doing. Some psychologists and philosophers, ob philosophers object that this way of analyzing things in using normal thinking and behavior as baselines for judgment illicitly slips a moment of moralization into the task of understanding mental disease. I don't think that's necessarily true but in any case, my concern is otherwise. And it's this, to presuppose a distinction in kind between psychopathology and normal psychology ends up leaving normal psychology unexplained. More precisely, since one of the privileges of psychological normality is being taken at face value, it leaves normality immune from analytical and critical scrutiny. If we presuppose instead that the difference between the normal and the pathological is that pathological states, because of the suffering they cause, call our attention to the problems of human life that remain concealed by the privilege of normality, we stand a better chance of getting a hold of the real nature and scope of the problems facing the normal, too. The second perspective, perspective allows us to use psychopathology as a window into the problems of life that it falls to all of us to try to resolve. I lay all this out by way of introduction to let you know where I'm coming from, but also to ward off a misunderstanding. I'll be bringing the concepts developed in thinking about compulsive hoarding to bear on practices of art. I would not like to be understood as arguing, therefore, that those practices are pathological, and even less that the artists themselves are pathological. I really do not mean that at all. Instead, I want to develop the thought that as art is a product of mind, it too seeks to address problems of human life, and in some cases, problems that, problems, um, that understanding the strategies of compulsive hoarding can help us to clarify. Okay. One introduction is now one more short introduction, and then I'll get to work. The literary scholar Elaine Showalter has referred to the last quarter of the 19th century as the golden age of hysteria. Over the course of 25 years, Showalter observes, hysteria went from being a rarely diagnosed condition with no agreed upon criteria to differentiate it from what was more commonly called malingering to the most common diagnosis in the psychiatric wards of Europe. 
In the same vein, we now live in the golden age of OCHD. The diagnostic category of OCHD only entered the DSM, that is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Diseases, which is the authoritative encyclopedia of mental and emotional diseases. It only entered the DSM in 2013, after being controversially distinguished from OCD, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, in the years between the publication of the DSM-4 revised in 2000 and the DSM-5 in 2013. Despite the fact that OCHD is a newly coined diagnostic category, the American Psychiatric Association, Association now estimates that between, between 2 and 5 percent of Americans suffer from it. Please ponder this statistic for a moment. Less than 20 years ago, there was no consensus among clinicians and research psychiatrists that the disease even existed. And now, expert judgment is that as many as 14 million cases of it are waiting to be diagnosed in the USA alone. We're within our rights to wonder if we're living through an epidemic of OCHD or a viral overuse of the diagnostic category which would ironically turn the diagnosis of OCHD into a kind of hoarding in its own right. I think, in fact, it's some of both. The epidemic of compulsive hoarding is a consequence of interconnected transformations in individual and clinical ways of making and understanding meaning and our broader relation to the world of commodities. More on this as we go along. A quick note on terminology. Um, like, like a child who, like a person, sorry, funny mistake, like a person who changes his name to help in forgetting his struggle for independence from his parents, OCHD sometimes goes by the clinical name HORD, capital H, capital O, capital A, capital R, capital D, which masks its affiliation from OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, altogether. Although the most persuasive theorists and therapists of compulsive hoarding rightly insist that the differences between OCD and OCHD must remain in sharp focus, more on this as I talk. I will use OCHD in this lecture for a very simple reason, and that's because I need to save the word hoard for its standard function as a verb, to hoard stuff, and as a noun, a hoard of stuff. Um, I, in an earlier version of this, I adopted hoard as the shorthand for OCHD, for obsessive compulsive hoarding disorder, and it made no sense reading it out loud. It wasn't clear whether it was a verb or a noun or something else. So OCHD. Okay, here we go. Compulsive hoarding at base is a disorder of ownership. Many of us are familiar with OCHD from the many reality shows about it. The hoarders, inside hoarding, hoarding, buried alive, there may be more. Um, that OCHD would become a popular television subject isn't surprising. What is surprising is that it's not on HGTV, since those who suffer from it are mad interior decorators. They care more than most of us about the appearance of their homes, and they tend that appearance with boundless energy and dedication. Hoarding may look to non-sufferers like a plague of randomness, and at certain moments it does look like that to the hoarders themselves, but that's not going to distinguish them from decorators. But closer inspection always reveals principles of cultivation in the hoard. The cultivation is not, however, driven merely by an idea of order, but also by a compulsion to display. One of the common practices of compulsive hoarders is to stack their possessions atop their dressers and chests while leaving the drawers empty. Perhaps then hoarders are less like mad decorators than mad curators, displaying all the pieces of their collection at once, currently installed or not. I will say more about installation and the rationality of OCHD below, but for now I want to underscore how the disorder appears to rest 
on such an extreme overestimation of the visual value of everything that ownership tips over into compulsive display. It's almost as if hoarders misunderstand the idea of ownership. Properly understood, the concept of property is an abstraction. One owns property in virtue of a socio-legal compact that binds the fate of what you own to you, regardless of whether you can see it or not. The compulsive hoarder doesn't trust this abstraction. Hysteria, it has long been argued, was a theatrical disease in the sense that the hysteric performed her suffering through the, through the presentation of her helpless body. The great neurologist Jean-Martin Charcot was thus not wrong, even if he was cruel, to turn the diagnosis of hysteria into a coup d'etatre. OCHD, by contrast, is a visual art disease, not a theatrical disease, in the sense that the compulsive hoarder displays his illness not in his body, but in his installation. Indeed, the priority of the presence nearby of possessions, which is to say of their visibility, is expressed throughout the diagnostic criteria offered in the DSM-5. And here they are, I'll read them quickly as you read them for yourselves. Um, someone has OCHD if they have persistent difficulty discarding or parting with possessions, regardless of their actual value. This difficulty is due to the perceived need to save the items and to, and to distress associated with discarding them. The difficulty discarding possessions results in the accumulation of possessions that congest and clutter active living areas and substantially compromise their intended use. If living areas are uncluttered, it's only because of the interventions of third parties. And finally, the hoarding causes clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning, including maintaining a safe environment for self and others. What distinguishes OCHD from obsessive compulsive disorder, from OCD, or at least this is the, the standard argument, is that the element of obsession is lacking in OCHD. I know when you look at those pictures, it's a little hard to believe, but I'm gonna explain what this means. The element of obsession is lacking in OCHD. According to Randy Frost, one of the leading defenders of the specificity of OCHD, and the main source for much of what I'm gonna say about the disorder here, OCD is fundamentally an anxiety disorder. Episodes of OCD, which in the extreme can swallow up days and weeks of the sufferer's life, typically begin with an intrusive thought about, say, contamination or invasion or injury. This intrusive thought sounds the alarm of imminent danger. To ward off the danger and silence the alarm, the sufferer is compelled to engage in rituals of avoidance, such as repeated hand washing or speaking a special sequence of words in exactly the same, in exactly the right order. So the obsession is the intrusive thought, the compulsion is the ritual required to hold off the danger. Um, the compulsive behavior is an anxious effort to banish anxiety. Note that nowhere in this cycle is there any positive emotion. The best that can be hoped for is the relief that comes from allaying the obsessive thoughts and returning to the status quo ante. Now, some behaviors characteristic of OCD are also present in OCHD. For instance, commitments to symmetry and inflexibility about norms of proper arrangement. Nonetheless, things are overall very different for hoarders. They're compelled to buy or scavenge or save, but it's only inhibiting them from doing so by, say, preventing them from going to the mall or diving into the dumpster or by forcing them to do a clean out. It's only that that causes unmanageable anxiety. This is what's at stake in, DS in the um, DSM-5's criteria B and C. 
intervention in the hoarder's activities causes psychological distress. Giving in to the compulsion is itself, however, entirely pleasurable. The key difference may be put this way. Whereas sufferers from OCD are obliged by a hidden force not to give in to the impulse that lurks inside their obsessive thoughts, sufferers from OCHD are obliged to give in to theirs. For this reason, Frost says, while people with OCD suffer from a compulsion to control their impulses, people with OCHD suffer a compulsive lack of impulse control. OCHD is in this light a disease not of anxiety, but of pleasure. And this, by the way, this is the central reason why um, people who call OCHD a hoard instead of OCHD, this is why they want to eliminate the word obsession from the diagnostic name, because obsession in the clinical sense has nothing to do with compulsive hoarding. Okay, so what's the connection between the compulsion that nothing be discarded and the visual display aspect of OCHD? An easy answer to this question would be that since every item in a hoarder's collection is a token of pleasure, that is of an impulse gratified, discarding any one of them would lead to a feeling of loss. We don't want to give up what has made us happy. The hoard, from this point of view, would be a kind of visual safeguard against the threat of desolation and mourning. But this interpretation can't be right as it stands. The relationship between an impulse, sorry, the relationship between an impulse, the object that satisfies it, and the feeling of gratification depends on the use of the object. But hoarders are no more able to use their hoard than they are to discard it. In fact, using things is for them a way of discarding them, making them disappear, which is why they so often leave whatever they acquire on their shopping sprees in its original packaging. It's worth noting that the idea that using things destroys their real value, this is shared by non-pathological collectors of, for instance, books and, poetry, uh, and pottery, who put their collections in display cases designed not only to inhibit their handling, but to showcase that they are not for use. Now, one of the more insalubrious styles of hoarding is saving food, even far beyond the date when it's safe to eat. Patently, an overabundance of uneaten food is an abundance of what hasn't gratified a need. If anything, then, the hoard represents not the memory of gratification, but of gratification foregone. This is paradoxical, though, since it suggests that despite the hoard accumulating from a lack of impulse control, its visual presence is testament to the restraint of impulse. Resolving this antinomy, resolving this contradiction, between the lack of impulse control and the resistance to the gratifying use of the stuff, this, I think, is the key to understanding compulsive hoarding. Following Frost's felicitous formulation, we must see that what hoarders hoard is not really stuff, although to the normal that's what it looks like. What they're hoarding is opportunities. They don't take pleasure in, cons in consumption as such, nor in foregoing consumption, but in the anticipation of consumption. The hoard, in other words, is a display of the open and endless future of desire. In this sense, open and endless, in this sense, or I should say in this sense again, the hoarder amidst his displays is the ultimate esthete. Now, the avidity with which hoarders value possession over use must, I think, inevitably remind us of the behavior of misers who refuse to let anyone consume a share of what they own. There is, to be sure, something zealous in the regard hoarders have for their collections. 
Characteristically, they don't want others to see it. And on some theories of OCHD, walling himself in is the hoarder's ambition. But the hoarder is not, for that reason alone, to be thought of as selfish, like the miser would be. While hoarders cannot, without distress, discard or sell things from their collection, they're frequently happy gift givers. Unlike misers, they're not resolutely opposed to the circulation of their riches, but only to the wrong kind of circulation. Although there are no empirical studies that directly support the inference I'm about to make, hoarders seem able to part from something they have withdrawn from the cycle of purchase, use, and gratification. If they imagine the gift being kept withdrawn from that cycle by the recipient as well. And as we'll see in a moment, they often add to their hoard based on the belief that the items will be of interest to someone else, based, that is, on the perception of their gift value. This makes the hoarder not a miser, but actually a kind of altruist, even though patently the structure of altruism is inverted. What the hoarder aims to serve is not people, but things, and the real or imagined interests of other people serves only as a means to that end. Perhaps we shouldn't really call this altruism then, for the concept of altruism commonly signifies direct regard for the interests of other people. Um, I'm not sure that there is a common name for this virtue of generalized and impersonal regard for the promise of future happiness embodied in every single thing in the world, this virtue that's at work in hoarding. And even if this generality and impersonality means that the hoarder also strives to ensure that the promise is never kept, unlike the miser, the hoarder does not jealously strive to keep valuable things out of the hands of other people. We might say then that hoarders stockpile indifferently on behalf of us all. What they hoard is the future and the price paid for that is a maniacally selfless regard for life in the moment. I'm not going to talk about this, but um, this is a, one of Armand's um, clock assemblages, a hoard of clocks. And in the lower right is a work by Alighiero e Boetti called Annual Watches, one for each year. So it's a hoard of the future. The best picture of the future then, and this I think is the thought that um, is at work in hoarding, the best picture of the future is a hoard of not yet broken promises. Were the hoarded promises of happiness to be tested one by one, no doubt they would prove largely false, as most promises do. It may even be that the falsity of the promises is sensed by people with OCHD, for they seem to have excellent reasons never to test those promises, which of course is why the hordes pile up. It isn't that the hundredth set of bedsheets is added because the first 99 were scratchy or ill-fitting or torn. As the bedsheets remain in their packaging, the disappointment was never experienced. Even as compulsive hoarders accumulate commodities endlessly, they seem somehow less susceptible than most of us to believing in them, to believing in the promise of the commodities. In fact, compulsive hoarders seem to have cleaved, a, cleaved, cleaved, cleaved clean apart the two contradictory meanings embedded in the concept of the consumer which in one sense means a user, to be a consumer of something is to be a user of it, but in another sense, central to the economics of societies of mass production, it means merely a buyer. Hoarders buy without using. As I said a moment ago, whether sufferers from OCHD are conscious of their skepticism is something we'll never be able to glean from their oral testimony alone. Because almost always, when called on to account discursively for their habits, 
supporters all too readily acknowledge that the horde is mostly useless to them. And in fact, if you ever watch any of the hoarder TV shows, this always happens. It takes no more than 30 seconds for the hoarder to look around and go, it's all junk. Right? This um, is offered up as a confession almost at the start of every episode. Um, so um, they're all too ready to acknowledge that the horde is mostly useless. They rarely even try to translate their reasons for accumulating beyond reason into reasons that are intelligible to non-sufferers. They rarely even try. This divergence of generally, of generally valid reason giving from actual practice, what you say from what you do, um, this is characteristic of psychopathology in general. And I'm going to conclude my discussion of the disorder with three short reflections on this divergence between reason giving and practice in OCHD. Now, one of the uncanniest activities of compulsive hoarders is what theorists and therapists call churning. Irene, who's Randy Frost's specimen patient in his book Stuff, Irene complains to him that she spends hours every day sorting through her stuff. The piles plainly never shrink. So Frost asks her to show him her sorting process. You have to picture the stacks cover every surface in the room. And keep in mind when I say that, that by surface, Irene means places that most of us with more miserly metaphysics wouldn't even consider surfaces, like pans turned upside down and cushionless sofas, because the cushions themselves have already been turned into surfaces in their own right. So every surface is covered with stacks. From one of the stacks, Irene picks up the top piece of paper. It's a months old newspaper clipping about drug use among teenagers. That, Irene explains, she means to give to her daughter, her teenage daughter. Um, but, as her, but her daughter is away at college at the moment, so Irene puts the clipping atop a nearby stack, explaining that keeping it on top, in other words, keeping it visible, will remind her to give it to her daughter the next time she's home. Back to the first stack now. Where the newspaper clipping once was, now exposed, Irene finds a promotional mailer from a phone company. That, she explains, she saved because it offered her cheaper rates. But as she hasn't yet had the time to explore the opportunity, she places it on top of the newspaper clipping. You can see where this is going. By the time Irene gets to the bottom of the stack that she's working on, she's done nothing but invert it top to bottom. Irene undertook the task with the express purpose of separating out the good stuff from the junk. In the end, though, everything was saved. And all she achieved was to shuffle it around. What's most amazing about churning, I think, is not simply that the stated reason for doing it is defeated. That seems to me the, um, that's common. That's human life, that the reason for doing it is defeated. What's amazing is not that the stated reason for doing it is defeated, but that it's defeated precisely by a process of reasoning. Irene is making a purpose of decision about each and every item she handles. But whatever her test of value, everything passes it. Frost calls this a, quote, problem with decision making, which is rather an understatement. Um, but it's hardly a problem of indecisiveness. It's instead a problem of too much decision making. Irene is nothing if she isn't a thinker. Indeed, she's a virtuoso at the intelligent perception of value to which others are blind. When she picks up a cap from a long lost pen, she churns it back into the hoard because it may be useful in the future as a piece in a board game. Frost finds himself forced into a sort of grudging admiration for her. The physical world of hoarders, he says, is different and much more expansive than for the rest of us. Now, his way of putting this, I think, can only be half right since the expansiveness of Irene's world is simultaneously the restrictedness of her life. 
On one hand, Irene sees value shining through everything. Wherever she turns her eyes, things worth saving are in plain sight. It turns out that the individual rational decisions to save each thing, and I'm going to insist that they are rational, since Irene never decides to save something that in her eyes is mere junk. That would be irrational. Right? This is rational decision making that um, her individual rational decisions express a kind of undifferentiated, even messianic love. To not discriminate the valuable from the contemptible is to experience a world suffused with good reason. Quote, a mixture of what seemed to me both worthless and valuable things, Frost says, was to Irene a collection of equally valuable items. This is exactly right. Hoarders are radical egalitarians. It's not that they refuse to judge. They're not stoical. But that for them, every camel makes it through the eye of the needle. At this point, we might pause to remember that the root of the word hoard, I'm sorry, that was an obnoxious thing to say, because um, I didn't remember this either. Um, at this point, we might pause to note that the root of the word hoard is an old English word meaning treasure, a word itself derived from a Gothic word meaning hidden treasure. Um, and while compulsive hoarders are not wrong to be radical egalitarians, that wrong, the pen cap would make an excellent game piece and certainly no worse than the stupid random hats and shoes that you get in a Monopoly game. Um, yet this egalitarianism is also the source of their illness. Life is sacrificed on the altar of the perception of value. To be unable to discriminate the dispensable from the indispensable is to be unable to live. However, as, Fro however, as Frost puts it, I'm sorry, however, as Frost puts it, expansive, the hoarder's world, it fails to leave room in it for one thing, the hoarder herself. It's the conflict between the self and everything in the world, the everythingness of the manufactured world that is on display in the compulsive hoarder's indifferent treasuring. So here I want to say again, to return to my opening remarks, that sometimes it falls to the sufferers of illness to show us a problem we all confront. The cure for the hoarder is, let me call it, the lesson of a higher indifference, which is to say, the acceptance of a state of exile from the shining world in which everything is valuable. The active hoarder refuses this lesson, and I confess, here's my expression of grudging admiration, I sometimes wonder how anyone accepts this exile. And yet, of course, we do doesn't mean we don't suffer it, but we accept it. In Frost's words, most of our lives are lived categorically. I'm sorry, most of us live our lives categorically, at least the part of, um, the part of our lives dealing with objects. Tools are kept in the toolbox. Bills to be paid are kept in a special place in the office and then filed after payment. Kitchen utensils go in a drawer, but Irene organized her world visually and spatially, not by category. Life demands assent to the categorical. This belongs and that does not. This is valuable and that's trash. From the point of view of normal psychology, Irene needed to clean up her life. Really though, what she had to do first was learn to make, sorry, was learn to believe in the mess. So my summary of several core features of OCHD has, I hope, let us see how compulsive hoarding makes visible problems of human life that concern us all. What's the price paid for the development of the ability to see with the force of unreflective immediacy what has no value? What was, that is, to see it without having to decide that it has no value. What must we leave behind for an endless abundance of values 
to become imperceptible. Is there any way to acknowledge the injuries inflicted by sorting? And what's the place of the thinking self in the world of value from which it is exiled? I'll take these questions up by turning to discuss now some works of art. For it is in art, I believe, that these questions are most frankly addressed. Near the end of my talk, I'll say something about why I believe this. So let me begin with what might as well be the pens to which Irene's vagrant cap once belonged. From 1972 through the late 1980s, the late Italian artist Alghero Boetti made a series of monochromatic works he called Lavori Biro. In English, this means simply ballpoint pen works, since Biro is the generic name in most of Europe for mass-produced ballpoint pens of the sort that everyone owns. Here we're looking at a Lavoro Biro from 1973 called Anonimo. The technique of this work is as simple as can be. Take a pen, make short vertical strokes of roughly the same length, left to right on the paper, leaving no space between strokes. Continue until the right edge is reached, then return to the left edge and start again. When a pen runs out of ink, continue the mark making with another identical pen, and so on. Stop when, well, that's the question. Stop when? Sometimes the answer is when there's no more paper to draw on. I'm going to show. Um, this is actually a different work with the same name. You'll see that he recycles names. I'm just showing this as a close-up because you can see better the mark making than you can in the larger installation. So stop when. Sometimes the answer is when there's no more paper to draw on. But that's not an answer that's internal to the practice. For there's no more aesthetic significance to the individual sheet of paper than there is to the individual pen. In fact, there's no natural limit internal to these works, no authoritative stopping point. The end of one work is nothing but the reason to start another one. Put otherwise, there's no firm principle of individuation within or between these drawings. It's not so much that they're serial works, one after another after another, as that they are one ongoing work, one way of working that contains within itself the possibility to go on and on. Yet the Lavori Biro offer, I think, more than the possibility of going on. They offer us, as I suggested a moment ago, just suggested, a reason to go on. And although we have only a hoary old name for this reason, I think we can see it in the drawings. It is their emergent beauty. It goes with that argument, I trust, that I'm not going to try to convince you that these are beautiful. This is a um, pointless thing to try to do. If you don't see it, you'll find very little of what I'm about to say convincing. Um, it goes with that argument, I trust, that the beauty of these works is not an effect of any of the individual marks, as no one of those marks stands out as decisive. You can't point and go, ah, there's the one that makes it beautiful. In any case, if the beauty were the, if, were the effect of a decisive mark, well, that would be a reason to stop. Right? Got it. That's the one I've been trying for. The beauty is, I think, precisely the effect of the absence of a decisive mark. It is an effect of, in other words, the radically egalitarian accumulation of pen strokes, of, if I may, the whole mess of them. No more marks are necessary once the beauty has emerged, but nonetheless, the next mere mark would be most welcome. No achievement of beauty is ever autocratically final in Alighieri and Boetti, which means that the possibility of more beauty of more value is never exhausted. 
there's bottomless reason and endless time to play. In, in the Lavori Biro, there's always a sensation of arbitrary stoppage, hence that something has been left out. One more mark, one more mark. Yet without that exclusion being irrecuperable or irreversible. This is not literally true, of course, since every work perforce ends eventually. So it's not literally true. But it's the illusion of their beauty that the work can be picked up again later. And so that all exclusions, injurious because arbitrary, are reparable. The illusion of beauty is where the injury of indifference is acknowledged. That is where it's felt, registered, experienced as, sounds fancy to say, the call for repair, but experienced as the call for one more mark. Back to Anonimo then. Um, we have to begin by noting that there is no such word as Anonimo in Italian. Boetti's title is a condensation of the Italian words anonimo with an A, which means anonymous, nameless, without attribution, and omonimo, O-M-I-N, which means homonym, but also namesake, a person with the same name. There's also thus a shade of onomastico, a word which is etymologically related to homonimo and which signifies the feast day when you celebrate your name. This semantic play expresses the thought that bearing a name, which is bestowed on us in recognition of our individuality within the family, also magically connects us to others outside the family who bear the same name. To have a name is to be a link in an anonymous chain. Remember how as a child, meeting another child with the same name was uncanny, as if the homonymy were the sign of some mysterious doubling. This magic of names is made explicit, or as we call magic when we make it explicit, religious, in cultures that officially celebrate name days where sharing a name with unknown others requires a festival. Right? I, we don't, I don't think we um, generally have name days, but the Italians have, have um, onomastico days. Having a name means being homonymous. It's an outcropping of anonymity at the heart of the self. Alighiero Boetti made this dialectic explicit when in 1968, he split his name in two, becoming Alighiero A. Boetti, Alighiero and Boetti, name and surname alike shared with others. Alighiero A. Boetti signifies not a discrete individual, but the overlap of two non-homogeneous principles of membership, two ways of being called out of yourself. With this thought in mind, let us look at one of the Anonimo drawings. The one you see up before you comprises 11 pieces of paper, each 28 and 3 quarters by 40 and 3 eighths. I haven't done the exact math, but my rough calculation leads me to conclude that there are 64,597 pen strokes here, give or take 10,000. Now, this might lead you to judge Alighiero e Boetti, an obsessive artist like, say, Yayoi Kusama, who did the same thing over, over and over again with strange, sometimes comic indifference to context. But if I'm right, that the beauty of this work is its sheerly additive force. The more strokes, the more value. Then this is not personal obsession, but the absence of a good reason not to add another mark. That is, it is compulsive and intrinsically impersonal. And this means that the marking can be handed off to others. I don't mean by this merely that others can do the work, 
but that there is no reason, given the technique in question and the way it creates beauty, why others should be excluded from it. Alighieri Boetti's is an ever-expanding practice in which the limit of one hand just is the presence of the next, so that the exclusion, you might say, is shared by one and all. All are exiled together from the beauty they together bring into being. Let me put this point now somewhat more concretely. The ballpoint, drawing, the ballpoint pen drawings were made by many hands, literally made by lots of people. Um, they shouldn't be thought of for this reason as abstract golden corpses. Does everybody know what the golden corpse is? It's the game you play, you fold up a piece of paper, you draw something on one strip, fold it over, hand it to somebody else, and so you end up with a surreal figure at the end. Um, so that's done by many hands, these are done by many hands. They shouldn't be thought of as abstract golden corpses since everyone can see what everyone else has done and in any case, everyone does exactly the same thing. Nor are these collectively made works, since there is no determinately nameable group of artists who made them together. We don't know. We don't care. In fact, given that all the marks we see are simple strokes of a simple ballpoint pen, there's no reason except maybe the very bad metaphysics characteristic of somebody like Joseph Beuys. There's no reason to think that there were any artists involved at all in making the Labori Giro. Rather, a swarm of collaborators transferred the ink from a hoard of pens to a hoard of pieces of paper. Lavori Biro are works made by no one in particular. They were made anonymously, right? which also, by the way, means that amonimo is um, eponymous. Right? It's named after itself. And possess, therefore, a highly expressive impersonality. Okay, we can now see how Alighieri, I hope, how Alighieri, we begin to see how Alighieri Boetti provides answers to the first of the two questions that I think OCHD made visible for us. What's the price paid for the development of the ability to sort things out perceptually? That is, to see with the force of unreflective immediacy what has no value. And what must be left behind for an infinitude of values therefore, thereby to become imperceptible. The price paid in learning to sort is that others are sorting as well. But we learn this by confronting the thing that is universally disvalued, that has passed out of the esteem of all. The limit of my categories is the presence not of other values, that's just cheap pluralism, but of what none value. The limit of my categories is the presence of what none value. That's the mess we're all in and that the hoarder must come to believe in. Sufferers of OCHD, paradoxically, strive to save it all because they can't bear the mess. This is where I would talk about Paul McCarthy. We can also bring into view an answer to the next question. Is there any way to acknowledge the injuries inflicted by sorting? The acknowledgement of the injuries, I'm trying to think with Alighieri Boetti here. The acknowledgement of the injuries is possible only within a practice in which no one is available to preserve the lost values from any available point of view. And this acknowledgement, which can of course also be a source of devastation, is made visible in a practice that can go on anyway. Go on anyway and go on anyway. Needs be, that would be a practice of expressive impersonality owned by no one. And this is where I would talk about Agnes Martin. Okay. So I've not yet elicited an answer to the fifth and final, fourth and final question. Lucky for you, I eliminated one of the questions. Um, the fourth and final question, 
what is the place of the thinking self in the world of universal value from which all are exiled. I will do so in a moment by means of a reflection on a ballpoint pen drawing called Issei Sensi, The Six Senses. Um, but as I will close this lecture with that reflection, I've got about three more minutes, let me first make good on the question why it is art that takes up the problem of exiled value. Just as compulsive hoarding is a disorder of ownership, so too is art. Now, put at such a high level of abstraction, philosophical abstraction, my point ignores art's specific place as one practice among the many that comprise the totality of our social life. I'm not happy about this level of abstraction, but I'm not about to apologize for it either. Since the consuming of our current social life by one form of value alone, which is the commodity, makes excessive abstraction, philosophy run amok, a price we may need to pay to get a glimpse of where we are. Um, another name for radical abstraction from the totality of social life is catastrophic historical dislocation. One might think here of Walter Benjamin's interpretation of Paul Clay's Angelus Novus, who has all of human history piled up before him, all of it, as a heap of rubble, right? as a heap of trash. Right? This is the hoarder. Excessive abstraction is not, however, the price art must pay to escape the reduction to ownership. The price it pays is the dislocation of the relationship between ownership and beauty. Alighiero e Boetti was a radically egalitarian impresario of impersonal perspectives, the indifferent community of which was the condition for the emergence of beauty. Beauty in his art is the illusion of an achieved egalitarianism of makers, but only an illusion as the disorder of ownership, in fact, keeps churning, or keeps us churning. For art is also a commodity, and it too has its hoarders. So to return to the final question, what is the place of the thinking self in the world of value from which it is exiled? The hoarder, recall, is sick, this is my claim, is sick from thinking too much. One might want to say, then, that the cure is thinking less. Oh, just throw it out and forget about it. That doesn't work. Um, Lord knows many have offered exactly this counsel, stop thinking so much. But if the problem we're dealing with is our fate in a world of um, disavowed values, thinking less is just evasive. Not thinking less, but thinking of thinking differently is the way to go. The six senses, what you're seeing here, as with most of the Lavori Biro, and for reasons I've now canvassed, is a name borne by many of Alighieri Boetti's works. He never used a name just once. The one I'm showing you now from 1974 to 75 has the characteristics we've come to expect. It's a very long, multi-panel piece, albeit a different one from what we saw, no, sorry, um, covered edge to edge and top to bottom with pen strokes. Um, it also makes use of a name game, albeit a different one um, from what we saw in Anonimo. In the six senses, the alphabet, see I'm showing you there, the alphabet runs down the left side of the work and functions as a decoding mechanism for the apostrophes that are scattered across the sheets. All right, so you see the apostrophes in there. Um, in Italian, remember, apostrophes are not, as they are in English, used to mark possession, but rather elision. Right, for instance, when an, artist, when an article ends with the same letter as a noun, the duplication is marked and excised by an apostrophe. So la, for those who speak Italian, this is boring, la amica, the female friend, becomes l'amica, because you don't repeat the A. And where the absent A was, you get an apostrophe. 
L apostrophe A M I C A. So apostrophes in Italian mark elisions, not possession. So the six senses is in, a, is in part about what is perceived as absent. This is essential in figuring out why there are six senses. The normal, I'm sorry, I mean familiar, five senses, are encoded on the first five panels. And you can't see it here because of the close-up, but right, the five senses are um, seeing, tasting, touching, hearing, and smelling, vedere, gustare, toccare, udire, and odorare. You can't see it the, right, V, E, D, E, R, E, right, so you can decode it across the panels. Right. So the first five panels um, spell out the familiar five sentences. senses. The last three panels are blank, unmarked, as if held open for senses yet to be discovered. But the last apostrophized panel, the sixth panel, spells out pensare, to think. Thinking is the sense for what is absent. Normally, I mean ordinarily, we do not regard thinking as a sense. But what would it mean to think of thinking as the sixth sense, the sense that perceives all that has otherwise gone unperceived, perceiving what is absent? What does it mean to consider thinking a sense, the sixth sense? a sense that registers all that has gone by. The thinking self in this light would be the perceiver of all the disvalue that has been sorted out, all that has been rendered imperceptible. It would have to be, therefore, intrinsically impersonal. Now, this way, of course, a kind of madness lies. Indeed, as Alighiero e Boetti's late sculptural self-portrait, Auto Ritrato, which I think we can regard as his version of the thinker, suggests, perceiving this, sensing this all on one's own, is a kind of hoarding that overheats the brain. The thinking self is most in need of indifference to what is most necessary for life. Thank you. And Greg, this is you to take some questions. And I'll just pass around the microphone for those of you who want to ask or comment. Um, I thought you were going to do one extra move in your talk, which I thought was uh, excellent. And that was to um, show that the pathology of hoarding, when it's put into the context of art, actually turns into a defense of the hoarder in the following sense, um, that the hoarder, as artist, um, achieves a certain kind of freedom from material and therefore makes use of the uselessness, the proclaimed uselessness of the artwork. And um, the, what you talked or didn't talk about as the adventure of form becomes something like the acquisition of form, um, that it's kind of bought. Um, the form is bought by the artist, and so the hoarding becomes a, a kind of freedom for the artist to use the material but be entirely indifferent to it mm -hmm. in the way that hoarders are indifferent to that, the material they collect. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that the, um, you could have a kind of um, pathology turned into a defense of the illness um, when it gets taken up into the artwork. Right. That's a lovely question. Um, I just wanted to give you um, just one dot, dot, dot to that. Um, 
there's a kind of view of mimesis, which is a Tom sort of view mm -hmm. of mimesis, which fits with this. Mima in Wagner's ring cycle is a hoarder. Mm -hmm. He's a hoarder of treasure. And the, n the name Mima is of someone who is um, mimetic, who um, identifies herself with the material that he or, he or she owns, but, and so on. But the mimetic trace becomes an archaic trace of that hidden treasure, mm -hmm. so that the mimesis becomes the hidden trace, not the explicit repetition of worldly material. So you have that kind of defense of the pathology of hoarding given through some kind of notion of mimesis as well. So yeah. it was more a comment, but it would be an additional side of your argument. But mostly I wanted you to change your subtitle to the acquisition of form. Um, it's interesting because that, because I, I love your question. That was, and that was the only turn in your question I didn't understand. No, the acquisition of form. Well, that doesn't get things set up for the rest of it. Um, well, because if I understand it, I'll change the title of my, of my talk. Um, you know, so can I, let me just respond uh, briefly to it. Um, the, the paper is um, a defense of the hoarder, right? right? And um, the, the, um, only way to defend the hoarder is to imagine a world in which hoarding is not a pathology. And I use Alighieri and Boetti to try to imagine a world in which hoarding is not a pathology. But in a world, but this is another arm of the paper. In a world in which hoarding is not a pathology, um, then um, the need for visual presence, it seems to me, would um, um, dissipate, right? So the defense of the pathology is also a way of imagining the pathology coming to an end. So not its continuing into aesthetic practices, but using aesthetic practices to imagine, to put the point one other way, a world in which the hoarder doesn't need a defense. Right? So I'm agreeing with you about this. Now, the, 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 the point about the relationship to mimesis is um, interesting. Um, it comes to the, the word greed as well. The word? Greed, greed. Greed. Yeah. Explain what you mean, sorry? Um, greed means acquisition. In greed, one form. That's the sense that greed, greed is not the sense of acquisition. When one's greed, greedy. Right. Yeah, that's why I was thinking about this acquisition. When one's greed, it gets expressed in relation to the notion of format. That's what I was thinking about. Right. In terms of acquisition. Not purchase. Right. Um, hunger. Yeah. Um, the the I'm not sure whether to think. I'm gonna give me give me a moment if I can. Do people mind? I so I want to do this twice, and it might come out differently. Um, it, it's hard for me to identify. I was thinking about this without knowing I was thinking about it. It's hard for me to identify the mimetic moment in pathological, that is, compulsive hoarding. Um, the, the, um, the hoarder is so disidentified with the material that were the hoarder not preoccupied with acquiring more of the material from which she is disidentified might allow 
uh, mimetic engagement to begin. But the mimetic engagement never gets off the ground. It's as if there's preparation for it, but everything that's acquired, it turns out, is um, no more um, um, desirable or desirous than what's been acquired already. So the activity just goes on and on and on and on. Right, now, right, exactly. What I'm trying to say about his drawings, though, is the drawings are kind of um, as uh, purely mimetic as you can get, right? That the desire to make the mark is shaped by the desire to make the same mark that the person before you made. So there's a kind of non-acquisitive mimesis that's at work in this. And that's why I can use the pathology of hoarding to gain an insight into the art, and I can use the art to get an insight into the pathology of hoarding. But don't, but don't those pen marks and that repetition in the end obliterate the pen marks by becoming monochrome in that way? No. So that you've got the obliteration there too? Well, so to, be, to begin with, um, two things. That's interesting. Because I wasn't sure whether to, well, you can see it pretty well up there. I wasn't sure whether to use the word monochrome. I mean, there's certainly not, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I, I had doubts about whether that was right or not. Um, there's certainly not polychromatic, right? There's, that's, that's not the alternative. But there is um, rhythm and variation, which is based on what? Which is based on the pen running out of ink. Right, so it's the same mark over and over. It'll be lighter or darker based on how much pressure the hand puts on the paper and how much ink is left in the pen. But um, that seems to me not um, dramatic in any way. Right, that's just a pure function of the technology that's being used to lay down, to lay down the mark. Sorry, there are other hands. I'm, I'm a lightweight, and I just have a question. I wanted to clarify something. You were talking about Irene and how she had a use for everything, but she placed an equal value right. on everything. I got a little confused when you said um, that people, hoarders, call everything junk. Like, it, it ha it's not important to them. It has no value. But using Irene, are you saying because she valued everything equally, it's not valuable to her? I, I got lost in this. Too. Right. What, what I was trying to say is that two things, that, and this might be confusion I created. So first, um, Irene, like every hoarder who comes um, under clinical regard, treated by a therapist, very quickly confesses that it's all of no value, that it's all valueless, that it's all junk, very quickly. Um, so quickly, I think it's not credible, right? But it's almost as if the demand to give an overview, that is to give an account of the form of the whole collection, that's a trial that leads them to confess that they're guilty immediately, right? Because what they don't get, what they don't want, is an overview, right? And this is, so now to bring it back to the other point, this is where the egalitarianism comes in. You might think that if they don't want an overview, they have a disregard for everything. That I think is not the right conclusion. It's that they have an equal regard for everything, which means there's no place to stand back and say, and here's the value of the whole, because everything is of exactly the same value. And that's why churning is so, it's, to me, it's utterly remarkable, right? Because she identifies the value of absolutely everything she saved. Does that answer the, yeah? If I could just add to that point, um, 
it's fascinating. It seems to me that that the real um, contrast in the hoarding and what Boetti is up to is the contrast between property on the one hand and I want to say on the other hand, experience or life. And so what allows the hoarder to think about all of those objects as equal is to not see them, as you said, as property, but to see them as um, unexpressed possibility, unfulfilled possibility, as promise. I mean, the other indication that it's not property is their willingness, the hoarder's willingness to gift the items. And so for me, one of the most striking thoughts underlying your, your presentation is the, the kind of the revelation that to what extent property is the most, um, the most confining prison in regard to the possibility of human experience or the going on. I mean, that's the way I interpret the line drawing is we're not making anything significant here. We're not making a piece of property that has some value. We are just continuing on, living, experiencing, whatever. And that has to be in contrast to property because property in some way is anathema, is, is the opposite of, is, is uh, thwarts, mm -hmm. not just experience, but thwarts uh, a more vibrant way of being alive. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I'm thinking. I'm sorry, it wasn't a question. I was trying to no, further it, that thought. There, there, I hear two halves of, of, of your comment. Maybe you didn't mean them to be two parts, but can I take them as two, two parts? Because they're both great. Or if it's only one, it's great. Um, so, you know, I said at the beginning that this is um, the first public presentation of the, of the material. And um, you put your finger on one, one way in which it is. Um, when I say that hoarding is a disease of ownership, what I really want to say, but I'm not ready to explain fully why I want to say this, is that it's a disease of the ownership of commodities in particular. And, and what I mean by that is that the concept of property is, for me, too abstract to do the work, the dialectical work that I needed to do here. Um, property, the proper, the what's mine, is on its own simply a way of withdrawing something from circulation, period. Um, sometimes withdrawing something from circulation is a way of valuing. So I don't want to say it's a disease of property, because I want to allow the possibility that property is a form of valuation that can be endorsed as life enhancing. Right? Um, and by the way, this has nothing to do with private property, common property, public property, right? I mean, if I, if I made this argument in terms of public property, it would be easier, right? A public park is withdrawn from circulation withdrawn from development, say, and that's a way of valuing it. So it's a property claim on it, which is not life-denying. It can be life-affirming. But there's something about property that takes the form of the commodity, which I think um, embodies a life-deadening withdrawal, because the commodity, I and mean, this is just Marx 101, the commodity has to both be an object of consumption and a preserve of value. And the way in which it has to do both induces illness. And the hoarder expresses that illness. This is why I said the hoarder is someone who cleaves the concept of consumer right in half and buys 
without using. So it's as if the one half of the commodity form is fully expressed. And you know what that looks like? It looks like death. So I, I accept your point, but I'd want to lodge it in the concept of commodity, not the concept of property more, more generally. Oh. oh, I thought, Peter, you were. Oh. So, uh, so, well, that raises a simple question. What then is the equivalent of that in Alighiero e Boetti? Um, what is the deathly? What is the deathly moment in Alighiero e Boetti, the, the cleaving? I mean, there, I, I, there's a phrase in Marianne Moore, the artist, the only seller who buys and holds on to the money. Right. Um, what is the kind of stasis that Alighiero e Boetti enforces? It, he seems to have, as Tom suggested, a kind of investment in ongoingness, in, in opening up, sta in, in, in preventing stasis. But if you're right that there's an equivalent of hoarding here, there must be a deathly moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, also a great question. Um, I, l l let me confess something first and then answer affirmatively. Um, I made it easy for myself tonight um, not just by excluding Paul McCarthy from this. Paul McCarthy is the other face, I take it, of this, of this phenomenon, right? Um, somebody who is um, so regularly involved in consuming and in the pathologies of consumption that um, what ends up coming out, and you can see this, I'm sorry, I'm going to get to back to A and B in a moment. Um, you can see this in, in the shape of Paul McCarthy's career, that for the first sort of 12 years, 12, 10, 12 years, all he was concerned about was consumption, right? And the, 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 the proof of that, aesthetically speaking, was that it was performance and video that interested him. That is, the ephemeral, that, the forms that wouldn't eternalize. And, and so what you get in Paul McCarthy is this obsession with the indifference between food and shit. And at a certain point, this is a very weird thing to say about, about an interesting artist, but at a certain point he looks down and he says, oh, wow, shit is interesting. And sees it all of a sudden as a moment of stasis in the endless, disgusting cycle of consumption recirculation. Now, so, similar question about Alighieri and Boetti. The way I made it easy on myself was by sticking only to the lavori biro, right? Only to the pen drawings. And the, the, I think the way to get at this would be um, to work more with the maps, right? I do think that the lavori biro. Who described the maps? Do people know his? I thought these were the. Um, one of the reasons not to do it's the works of his that are probably best known. They're maps of the world that he sent. He used to go um, up until 1979, the, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. He used to go twice a year to Afghanistan. And he worked with um, um, women who weaved in Afghanistan because he was interested in weaving. Not surprising for someone who's interested in the um, in, 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 in the pens like this, right? Um, and so he developed a, a process where he would send a map to Afghanistan and have it embroidered by um, the women he had worked with. And it wasn't, there's was a little bit of, a little smell of outsourcing about it in a way, and I think he was aware of that, because um, of course the idea of an uh, Italian designer sending something out to have the fabric woven somewhere else is like a kind of joke about Italian manufacturing. But he sent it out, and the women would, would um, embroider the maps. And he asked them to use as the colors of the countries the f national flags of those countries. So 
every map is a kind of very static political projection, right? This is the world as seen from a certain political point of view. And on the one hand, they're very static. And what he kept doing in sending, in getting more and more of the maps made, is he um, encouraged the possibility of a map coming back that would be um, aggressed against, a stasis that would be aggressed against. And there are some very extraordinary ones, one of my favorite ones, where, you know, they're just maps. It's not like he designed this. He just got a standard map and sent it over. And the map came back, and it had the national flags representing the individual countries. Um, but the oceans were pink, right? Not blue, not green. And it's funny to read the literature on this, because one explanation uh, that I saw was that, well, Afghanistan's a landlocked country. And so, of course, the weavers wouldn't have known that oceans are blue or green and not pink, which is an utterly insane <laughs> colonializing explanation. Not, not only because you don't have to have seen the ocean to know that it's not pink, but he sent them the maps. The maps showed the oceans as blue. Right? But what happened was something like, he didn't specify what color the oceans should be. There was lots of pink thread left over. So they used the pink thread to make the oceans. And this is a startling, um, put it technically, almost like a convergence of two different economies. There's the static political economy of the map as seen, the political layout of the world, and this other economy of the um, hoarding, preservation, recycling of the, um, of the thread. So the, the, the way to get a hold of the stasis, I think, would be to get a hold of his um, use of standard forms. You don't get that in these. That's why I say I made it easy on myself. Does that answer the? Unless we want to take one out from people of a certain age and move on to different. I'm of a certain age. Okay. So right I right, will stick with this generation for a second. Uh, this is sloppy towards the end of it, so I was thinking you could perhaps clean it up. So. I'm so happy that you are embracing and defending hoarding, and I, I love this. <laughs> I love this. Not that I'm one, but I now want to make as many friends with hoarders as possible because I love this thought. Just going back, not to Ellen's question, but to what Tom was referencing, about hoarding <coughs> as a, an activity that sees through the object to its potential not by using the object, but by not using it, and therefore reaching through the object, touching its potential and leaving it right there only to be treasured for its potential. And it strikes me that that way of thinking about hoarders is that they are important artifacts of a village or a social system that every community, every village, needs a certain number of hoarders because they retain and they codify the potential experience that that community or that village can have. So to an artist like Boetti is retaining, codifying, holding on to experience we have yet to have right. for the community. You know, it's sort mm -hmm. of like we need a certain number of these pathological folks in our lives, both in terms of seeing through objects and also in making these pen strokes. And so it's not a question, it's sort of like clean up the thinking because where, where I get stuck then at the end of that is why do we have, why is there this collective need to then turn that into pathology when it seems so vital an activity, both what Boetti has done and what our local neighborhood hoarder is doing every day for us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I, 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 I just want to say yeah to that question. So, um, um, the, the, you know, I, I tried to set this up at the beginning of the talk, and I did not pretend to answer it. There is something berserk about the use of this diagnosis now. It went from being arguably not an illness at all to being an illness that 14 million people suffer from in the space of 20 years. This is a sign 
not that there are a lot more sick people than we thought, but that there's something that hoarders are doing that didn't look to us pathological, and now it all of a sudden looks scary. Right, so that transition, I think, is not a transition in what the hoarders do. It's a transition in, you might say, what we can do with hoarding, what we can do with hoarders. Right? And I think that is mutating right now. So the question is, why is that mutating? Right? And this, isn't, this is a question for intellectual and psychological history. I could speculate. I will just briefly, because I know we're about out of time. But um, um, part of the way in which commodities forcibly circulate is by means of the credible insistence, that is an insistence that we believe, that using them will add value to our lives. So um, the, the, the um, commodities pile up in front of us, and we're called on to consume them, to use them more and more and more and more and more. And this, the, the speed, the velocity of that demand, I think in the last 50 years, has skyrocketed, has absolutely skyrocketed. I put this point another way. I don't think that you can find any remotely um, diagnostic use of this category remotely diagnostic prior to the last 100 years, right? For A, there's not enough crap in the world to build up a hoard. And secondly, accumulating more by withdrawing it from circulation would serve the social function of preserving a memory of the future, right? Not a memory of the past, but a memory of the future. There's something about the commodity form that um, makes that, the commodity form, not the rubble of history, but the commodity form, that makes that almost impossible, right? We do not see the future when we look at the giant stacks of bed sheets at Target, right? We see a kind of endless present. And so when we look at the hoarder now, we don't see memoriousness of the future. We see the refusal to consume, and that looks like illness. Hi. Um, hey. So I was just really interested, just because like immediately when you're talking about kind of the, uh, the woman who's kind of hoarding these like articles and news clippings and stuff like that, I was thinking kind of personally, I'm like freaking out. I'm like, it sounds like me going through the internet, clicking through, dragging and, you know, um, saving pieces of articles, memes, images, whatever, and throwing them into a hard drive. Um, and I collect hard drives, basically, I just have stuff filled up to the brim, like kilobytes of just, I guess, kind of useless information, but at the same time, it has enough meaning for me to hold on to them. And I was wondering, kind of like, in kind of a, a society, I suppose, where the object is becoming less and less tangible, um, what differentiates, in your mind, kind of like the physical tangibility of like physical hoarding and like, I guess, digital hoarding? Yeah. yeah and yeah. like, where does that Kind that's of, because I feel like we, I at least personally, I feel like there's a, a easy, an accessibility to digital hoarding. Yeah. It doesn't take up room and you know rooms full of space and stuff like that. You can keep it to yourself, mm -hmm. and it doesn't seem as I guess crazy. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to yeah. use that term, but well, yeah, <laughs> no, it is crazy though. Is, as you know, the thought that you can keep it to yourself. Yeah, right. You're mm -hmm. not keeping it to yourself. Right. <laughs> um, she, Irene, has a better chance of keeping it to herself than you do. Um, but I think this is, I think this is a totally super question. There, there are, um, can I, I'm going to just put those images back up on the screen. Right, I mean, it, this looks, this is what the inside of your hard drive would look like. Yes, definitely. If the inside <laughs> of your hard drive had a look. Right, which, which in a way it doesn't. And I think that um, the, the um, um, 
How do I want to put this point? The problem of hoarding won't, the problem of how to hoard won't go away simply because all the information becomes digital, right? It won't go away. It won't look like that, right? But I don't know what it will look like. But for now, that's not a bad image of what it looks like, right? And, and you, you can imagine, I mean, books are, are um, books are themselves, when you, when you think of it, they are hordes, right? They're hordes of information. And so that's a horde of hordes already. And I, I don't want to speak for anybody else in this room, but last night when I was putting the finishing touches on this talk, that's what my desk looked like. Not that bad, but that's what it looked like. Because what I was trying to do was I'd have all this stuff stored up, and I wanted to make it pay off in the future, that is tonight. But in order to do that, I had to take everything apart, right? So the hoard quality of it was, was um, vivid to me. When I get, well, I won't do it tonight, but tomorrow morning, I'll put them all back together, right? So I just think, I just think that right now, that's the, best quest that's the best image we have of overload. OK. Thank you. Great.